So now I know there's much, much more to say, and every, but I have some questions from the audience, so I'd like to uh, read those, and, and I'll try again uh, just to divide up the time and the questions, uh, hopefully, as fairly as possible. Um, so, uh, Professor Peterson, let's start with you. Uh, so this question says, um, you present your issue with Bill C-16 to be that the infringement of freedom of expression regarding gender pronouns is a problem. Do you hold the same stance with other discriminatory language in the Human Rights Code, such as being able to use uh, racist uh, terms uh, with regard to students? And if you believe that one of these things is a violation but not the other one, why? I'm not sure I read that out okay. all that yeah. well, but you get the idea. Okay, well, so one, one thing I would like to point out be before I answer that, just so you all notice, is that I have, in fact, been denounced today. And what I am saying has, in fact, been described as hate propaganda. So one thing I'd like to suggest to you, every single person in the audience, you're next. So keep it in mind. All right, so with regards to the question, well, first of all, I don't think that these issues are the same. I don't think they're the same at all. I mean, I've think, been thinking about the pronoun thing, you know, because one of the things that people... It put me back on my heels for a while because the claim was basically, well, it's something like, why doesn't the mean professor just play nice and, and respect people by using their pronouns? And it took me like three weeks to unpack that because who gets questioned about pronoun use? I don't know why the hell I use the pronouns I use. I use them because they're part of the language. I use he and she because that's what everyone uses. And so then I had to think about, well, why... Why do we, in fact, use pronouns? And we use them in part for the same reason that we use other categories, and that's to simplify the world for functional purposes, roughly speaking. But then I was thinking, well, is the use of he and she a mark of respect? And the answer to that is, well, no, it's not a mark of respect. It can't be a mark of respect. What you call four billion people can't be a mark of respect, right? It's a, it's a mark of basic categorization. And so then the claim comes up, well, if someone wants you to use a particular pronoun, then you're disrespecting them if you don't. It's like, hmm, okay, let's think that through a bit. Well, that assumes that when I'm using he or she for, for people in, you know, in normal parlance, that I'm actually indicating my respect for them. And that's not true. It's like, if I don't know you, I class classify you generically. And basically, I classify you in terms of how you present yourself publicly. I suppose that's your gender expression. And then I nail you with whatever pronoun seems to fit. It has nothing to do with respect. And besides that, you bloody well don't get to demand my respect. Why should you? You know, I mean, it's not like I respect everyone. That's a foolish thing to do. You respect people who are respectable. You know, you, you make value distinctions between people, and that doesn't mean you illegally discriminate against them. Those aren't the same thing. But I'm all for value judgments. If, if you don't buy value judgments, then... Why bother learning anything? Why, why bother doing anything? Why go from one point in your life to another if the next point isn't better in some manner? So don't tell me that I'm not respecting people when I don't use their gender pronouns. And the other thing is, I don't buy this whole idea that the people who are putting this legislation forward are valid representatives of the trans community. That's what they say they are. We have mechanisms for deciding whether someone's a valid representative of a community, and that generally involves democratic voting. I've received at least 20 letters from transsexual people who are on my side, and by the way, zero from others, believe it or not, who are perfectly happy with the idea of gendered pronouns. It's just they want to be the other one. Now, you can have a discussion about that, and there's lots of things to be said about it, but the idea that this community that's coming out and these, demanding these rights is somehow representative of this homogenous, oppressed minority, I think, is rubbish. Well, that leads us to our next question. And for this question, I'm going to ask uh, both uh, Professor Kosman and Professor Bryson uh, to comment on it. Um, so one of the objectives of the transgender and queer rights movement is to enter into public conscience um, in a way. And this uh, person asks, uh, this can only occur through public conversation. Uh, do you worry that it's, it may uh, not be possible to have thoughtful discussion if there is government restriction about uh, this kind of speech? And do you worry that it would skew discuss, discussion in one uh, direction or another? Uh, so perhaps uh, Professor Kosman first, and then Professor Bryson. So I've 
spent a career being concerned about the way in which um, thoughtful discussion is often shut down. And I've been concerned about it on the right, I've been concerned about it on the left, and I've been concerned about it in the mushy middle. And, and I think that Professor Peterson has actually performed some of this today, insofar as he just said that he was denounced here today and that they're going to come for you next. So the thing is about speech is that everybody gets it. And you say something and you then get criticized. So Professor Peterson hasn't been denounced, some might want to, um, but he has been severely criticized. And that is actually what speech does. That is what speech does. I think that, um, I think that there is an important way to have public discussions um, around a whole range of issues. I would welcome a discussion on the role of hate speech provisions. I would welcome a discussion around the role of hate speech and its desirability um, about whether the Supreme Court of Canada is right or not right in upholding its constitutionality. But I would like to have that debate with someone who is knowledgeable about the law. Thank you. And Professor Bryson. One of the big questions that I had to deal with in considering whether or not to accept the very generous offer, uh, invitation of the University of Toronto to come here today would be the impact of this event on trans and gender non-binary people, uh, specifically at the University of Toronto and much more generally. And so, whereas I would say that I recognize practices of peer review, and practices of peer review are not denouncement. Practices of peer review are practices that we utilize to make assessments about knowledge claims. Whereas I would fully appreciate being able to enter into a discussion about gender and gender identity and issues around trans culture as a means of practicing peer review, I think the difficulty that we've had, and we've managed to reproduce this difficulty here today, uh, characterized just now by Dr. Peterson as simplifying the world for functional purposes. Simplifying the world for functional purposes is not what I recognize to be academic practice. This is not how we relate to knowledge. And so I think that there's a concern when we don't subject claims that are being made as knowledge claims by people who carry titles at great Canadian universities, when we don't treat those knowledge claims in the same way that we would in any other field. And when their knowledge claims made about members of minority groups, embattled, vulnerable, marginalized members of minority groups, then I think that we all need to be very concerned about how it is that we're changing what we think we do in the university, which is supposed to be about the advancement of knowledge and excellence. Thank you. Well, it's increasingly accepted, the wisdom of this age, is that everybody is allowed to define his or her own identity. Your gender is not determined.